too long. See how things go. And then, because uh, there was another talk later on as well, so it's all, it's all happening here. Okay. Dear Ajahn, is someone who keeps quiet most of the time while uh, speaking facts, though it may hurt others, uh, may hurt others, keep, keep due to wrong timing, be, uh, be practicing right speech? Um, Well, you have to, I again, it's about hurting others. It depends on how you hurt others, whether it's required or not. Uh, yeah, so sometimes it is uh, kind of required, uh, and other times uh, it is not, so it really depends. And again, the most important thing is uh, that your intention is in the right place. Sometimes people just have a kind of bit rough way of talking, it's just a character or something. Uh, and of course, then it's a problem for them, but it's not a problem in terms of karma, it's just a problem for their relationship with other people. Uh, so just come back to this idea of intention. Yeah, if you speak facts and you hurt others uh, uh, due to wrong timing, yeah, then it is not necessarily bad. It would depend on the intention of that person. Uh, but uh, the ideal there is just to move towards compassion. Yeah, how can I be more compassionate to people around me? And if you move towards compassion all the time, uh, then quite likely your speech will be also become more, become better, uh, and become more. Uh, uh, become more uh, in accordance with these uh, rules that we just have been looking at of these, uh, uh, the, the story there, uh, the, uh, the gradual training here. So intention, 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 motivation, where you're coming from is what really matters. Okay, why are some people unreasonable and jealous? How to deal with them? How to deal with people who are unreasonable and jealous? Um, I sometimes you cannot do too much with other people. This is one of the problems in life. You can do something with yourself, uh, but you cannot do too much with others. If others are jealous, you know, sometimes you uh, maybe you can take them to a Dhamma talk and you can ask the teacher to talk about, talk about jealousy, uh, yeah, something like that. Uh. <laughs> you can do that with Ajahn Brahm. Yeah, you can ask him to talk about jealousy. Maybe that, that's a smart move, probably. Uh. And um, so, uh, but. Uh, Really, a, a lot of the solution is in your own attitude to it. Uh, again, everything in the world is about understanding that other people are the way they are because of conditions, yeah? And that uh, often you cannot really expect them to be otherwise. Uh, the thing is that we, we think that people can choose. Uh, they can choose to be different. They don't have to be like this, but it's not actually the case. We can't really choose how we want to be, or, or it's very limited how much we can choose. Uh, if you are jealous by nature, uh, you can't just overcome it like that. Uh, it's very hard. If you're an angry person by nature, it's not easy to overcome just like that. Uh, so uh, for that reason, don't expect too much of other people. Uh, don't expect that they will change. And if it is too hard to be around someone who is jealous or difficult or unreasonable, then uh, don't be around them so much. Uh, yeah, reduce your uh, re frequency of uh, socializing or whatever with that person, uh, because uh, otherwise it's just painful for yourself. Uh, you have to look after yourself. Uh, this is so important in this life. And uh, usually people who are jealous or unreasonable, whatever they are, if you are kind to them, uh, eventually they will kind of, you will come like a mirror to them and they start to understand themselves, that the, the problems. The best way to understand a problem is if the person themselves understand the problem. Uh, Anyone else outside tries to tell them, usually they re will resist uh, and it won't be possible to do that. Uh. So a lot of the hardest part of the path is often the idea of acceptance. Accept the way things are. Do a little bit, do what you can, but understand the limits of what you can do. Uh. Otherwise you're just creating so much dukkha for yourself. So I, I'm sure that's not the answer you wanted to hear, but anyway, that's the, that is the answer nevertheless. Uh. So uh, we want, usually we want solu immediate solutions, but that's kind of the point with samsara, is that there are no immediate solutions. If there were immediate solution, then existence wouldn't be such a problem. Uh, is the, the whole point with these difficult people is to also to gain some insight into what people are like, what the world is like. And the more you gain insight into that, the more, the less interesting it all becomes. Uh, because you understand you can't control it, it has to be this way. Uh, and uh, then you kind of move away from that and you understand the spiritual path is really where it is all at. Uh, that's what you have to do here. Uh. Okay.
Ajahn, number one, chanting does have its benefits. Okay? Recalling the qualities of the Buddha, Itipso Bhagavad Samma Sambuddho, and realizing that in the suttas uh, that I have heard so far, none of them specifically define the, uh, the factors of the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, which all begin with Samma, Samma Vayama, Samma Padana, is a culmination, the perfection of effort, uh, not virya energy being the result of Samma Vayama. Uh. Would you like to speak more about Samma? <laughs> uh, CPD, uh, this is the uh, 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 yeah, properly, rightly, thoroughly, uh, PED, thoroughly, properly, rightly, uh, in the right way, uh, as it ought to be best, uh, perfectly opposite of Mitcha, and the CPD, but uh, doesn't actually have it in there, because the dictionary doesn't have all of those, uh, uh, seems to such right, seems to such an understatement. Uh, um, yes? Sometimes Samma is translated as perfect, uh, yeah, perfect view, perfect uh, uh, each of the factors. Uh, that's another way that is it is translated. Uh, so you are trying to perfect it, I suppose, down the down the track. Uh, but uh, it's not a word that occurs in very many contexts in the suttas, as far as I know. Uh, so for that reason, it's well, Samma Sambuddha. That's true. That would be the perfectly enlightened one there. But it doesn't occur so often, and uh, the reason that for that reason makes it quite hard to really pin it down exactly uh, what it means. Uh, so um, I don't know. I think you know the, the rightly the maybe I think right works reasonably well. The right effort. Uh, some people complain about that. They complain that it's like a dogma if you say this is right effort. Uh, yeah, it's like a dog dogma. This is what you have to do. It becomes a bit like God giving the Ten Commandments, a similar kind of thing. This is right. Don't do anything else. But it's not s right in that sense. It is right in in uh, relation to uh, to the big picture of Buddhism, of overcoming dukkha, suffering, and of achieving happiness. It is right in that particular context. So because of that, it um, uh, yeah, it's 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 different from the idea. It's not a dogmatic statement quite in the way that you might think it is. Uh, so right effort, really, right effort is anything that leads you in the right direction, yeah? Anything that kind of uh, moves you towards more purity. The purpose of right effort is largely to purify your mind. You go through the sequence, you have Samma Vajra, Samma Kamanta, Samma Ajiva, that's all the ordinary purification by morality. And then, when that is done, then of course you have to purify the mind. That is what Samma Padana, Samma Vayama is, is all about. And then you have samasati, which is uh, more of the more of that. You have some very last defilements to get rid of. Uh, that's done through samasati, and then you get the samasamadi coming out of that. Uh. So samapadana is a very broad thing. Yeah, it's all about uh, kind of thinking correctly and, and all of that. It's kind of yoni somani sikara is sort of involved in that. Uh, sati sampajanya is partly involved in that, uh, and all kind of coming coming together in a sense. But uh, I don't know. I, I personally, I, I'm I am happy with right. Personally, right effort. Uh, I'm not sure if there is any better translation. I have thought about it before. I couldn't really find a better translation, in my opinion. Uh, perfectly is wrong. So, mi mi uh, sorry, mitcha is wrong. So then, the opposite would normally be right. Uh, but uh, yeah. Anyway, so I'm not not sure. I'm sort of happy with with right. But uh, you know, maybe you have a point. So maybe you have to write your doctoral thesis on this particular word, and then... Uh, <laughs> no, okay. Okay. Second question. A. N. Anguttara Nikaya 4, 111. Kesi Sutta, Sanha, Parusa, Gentle and Harsh are mentioned for Vineti. Lead, train, instruct, remove. But not for Basati, speak. Uh, would it be appropriate to apply it to uh, to actions by speech. Mm. Okay, so it is. Yeah, so you train someone. You do that. Sanha and parusa, gentle and harsh. Uh, but speech, you don't actually have that. It's not actually mentioned in that way. Okay, I, w I think I will have to look it up first of all before I comment on that uh, because uh, I, I want to like see the context a little bit and see what it is what is happening there. So let me put that to one side and I'll come back to it later on uh, and see what happens. Dear Ajahn, is attainment of the four stages of awakening or enlightenment linked to the attainment of the jhana states? Uh, please explain further. Uh, 
Yes, they are very strongly linked because in a sense it's the same thing that you are doing. The movement along the Buddhist path is a movement of purification but also a movement of abandoning things. Yeah, so as you move through the jhanas, you're abandoning your attachment to so much and the entire sensual world uh, is kind of let go of when you enter the jhana state. So this is really big, yeah, this is really big. We are, I mean, we live our entire life immersed in the sensual world. All we see around us are sensual things from the moment you wake up in the morning to go to bed at night, uh, apart from when you do a bit of meditation perhaps, uh, depending on what kind of meditation you have. Uh, if you think sensual fantasies in meditation, then that too is part of that sensual world. Uh, and you go to bed at night, you dream, and you dream more sensual. It's just endless. Yeah, the sensual world is we are so utterly trapped in this world. You know, you, you walk around in your daily life. Everything we do, from the moment we're born pretty much to we die, is an aspect of that sensual world. Uh, so one of the first steps is to extract yourself from that sensual world. And that extraction happens in the jhanas. This is the first, that's why this is a powerful state of insight. Uh, because you actually left that world for the first time. Uh, and that's why it is so weird and strange. I've never seen anything like this before. Yeah, the whole sensuality uh, is kind of gone. No desires for any of these things anymore. And yet, you are fully content and happy as a consequence. So it's powerful. So this is why these are the jhanas are steps in that direction to the insight of stream entry. When you become a stream entry, you have insight into all the five khandhas, including the mental khandhas. So you know everything is impermanent and non-self. That's the difference. So there you have everything. In the jhana is only the sensual world. So it's easier to go via the jhana than not to go via the jhana because the step is less. There's less of a step. You abandon things gradually rather than gra abandoning everything straight away. Yeah. It's interesting in the suttas. <coughs> the um, Buddha always places the four jhanas in the same category as the four stages of awakening. Yeah, they always come together. Four jhanas, four stages of awakening. So you're very close to awakening when you come to the jhanas. And uh, so the often the context gives you a lot of information on how profound these things are. They are the sutta we're reading now is the Majjhimanikaya 27. And in there the jhanas are called the Tathagata Pada. Pada is a footstep of the Buddha. Yeah, these are footsteps of the Buddha. When you come to the jhanas, you know the Buddha would have been here, yeah, because this is so profound. These are the sort of thing the Buddha would have to go through to reach awakening here. So, and, uh, so this is, you know, these are some of the ways the jhanas are described in the suttas as very lofty things uh, on par with the stages of awakening themselves. So, Yeah, so you, when you come out of a jhana state, uh, then you have much more insight into reality. You know that the whole sensual realm is just not really worth holding on to. Now you really start to understand dukkha. You start, the whole sensual realm is dukkha. That's what you re really see here. And uh, for that reason, there's only a little bit left to let, let go of. And that is the, the mental phenomena, yeah, the mental phenomena in the first jhana state. Uh, that's what you have to let go of after that. Uh, so you then turn your attention on those jhanas uh, and you see those jhana states as also being impermanent. Uh, and when you see them as impermanent, you realize that they too are problematic. They can't be sustained. You have to give them up as well because uh, you can't sustain them. There's no point in kind of hanging out there because eventually you come back to even more dukkha, the sensual world and all of that. Uh. Number two, during meditation, can a yogi practice anapanasati and vipassana meditation in the same sitting? Uh, since both are medit meditations on the breathing. Yeah, thank you. Well, anapanasati is vipassana meditation. Yeah, these are not different things. They are the same. So uh, when you practice anapanasati, the mindfulness of breathing, yeah, you, it is both samatha and vipassana. You become more quiet and calm, but you also gain more insight. You have more clarity in your mind, because when you are more calm, you have more clarity. Yeah generally, unless you're kind of slothful or whatever, of course, then it doesn't work, but assuming that your these hindrances are gone. So these are really the same. And this is what is fascinating by with the suttas, is that samatha vipassana is almost always a compound. They occur together in the suttas. In other words, you develop them together. Yeah? Talks about what you should develop is always samatha vipassana. So they come together, they're not separate. So when you're more calm, you have more vipassana. When you have more vipassana, you are more calm. They have to develop together. Why? 
Because the cause for samatha is the same as the cause for vipassana. The thing that stops you from having samatha is the five hindrances, the defilements of the mind. The thing that stops you from having vipassana is also the hindrances, uh, because it distorts the mind. You see happiness where it isn't. Uh, so you have, you have less vipassana, you have less clarity, less clear seeing. Uh. So the cause is the same. But because the cause is the same, they have to arise together. Uh. They can't really be independent of each other. Uh. So there is no such thing as vipassana meditation in the suttas. It doesn't occur. All there is, there is vipassana as a result of meditation practice, not as a kind of meditation practice. It doesn't exist. So you just practice ordinary meditation, and that is everything. Yeah? You don't, all you need to do is to watch the breath. Yeah? You don't have to do anything else. You don't have to watch the feelings in the body or anything like that. Just watch the breath. It will take you all the way to awakening if you do it properly. Yeah? And I would usually recommend that, because this is how the Buddha talks about meditation practice. Yeah? The Buddha talks about Satipatthana practice, and he, uh, the only type of meditation that he says fulfills Satipatthana is the breath meditation. It fulfills everything else. Uh, he doesn't say that about any other subject. Uh, so get onto the breath, yeah, and easy. Uh, actually, not so easy, but you know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> simple, don't have to make it too complex. That's the, that, that's the point. Uh, keep it simple, uh, and then you can, uh, you can do that. Uh, so samatha and vipassana go together, not separate, separated like that. So when people say this is vipassana meditation, it's just marketing. It sounds good, yeah? Insight meditation. Wow, I would like some insight meditation. So it sounds good, but all meditation is insight meditation. All meditation is uh, clear seeing. Yeah? And this division in the Buddhist world, there's, there's really no foundation for that. Uh, and uh, yeah. Okay. Many people might disagree with me on that one, but that's my position here. Number two, during meditation, can a yogi practice anapanasati and vipassana meditation at, at the same set? Oh yeah, just, that's the one we just did. Okay, good. So, um, <coughs> what are the best or the most reliable sources to learn Pali? Wow, you're really getting into it, aren't you? So that's pretty, pretty cool. So, if you want to learn Pali, one of the resources that I learned Pali with is a, uh, is a there might be better resources now. That's the one I use. This is a, by A. K. Water, Introduction to Pali. And uh, if you go online, there's a, a website called the Wid uh, Wisdom and Wonders, uh, and this Wisdom and Wonders actually contains. That's done by some, not done by me, done by someone else, but it contains the Pali classes that I gave at Bodhinyana Monastery here. Yeah. So the point of that is because when you read the book, it is very dense. Yeah, you have to be a language student to be able to kind of understand what is going on. Uh, so the point of having a Pali class is to explain to people what these concepts and words mean in this book, which is so dense. So Wisdom and Wonders website is, is a good place to, to go to uh, be able to uh, learn Pali. Uh, so, um, yeah. What are your thoughts on the different traditions of Buddhism? Theravada, Mahayana, Tibetan, Chan, Zen. And maybe Pure Land and whatever else, there's lots of different things. So, um, um, I think one of the things we have to be careful with in Buddhism is that, again, we tend to differentiate too much. Yeah? Us against them, oh, they are Mahayana, they are, they, what, what do they know, that kind of thing. And, and, uh, but very often it turns out that things are not that simple. Uh, you read some of the Mahayana monks in the world, or Vajrayana monks, and I remember reading a book by Dalai Lama many, many years ago, 10, 15 years ago or something, and I thought, wow, it's actually very straightforward Dhamma. Watch the breath, be kind, you know, that, that sort of thing. Very straightforward Dhamma. And I think this is kind of the point, is that very often the teachings actually are the same across the board, precisely because we come from the same roots. Not always, in many cases perhaps not, but they are, yeah, they are, they're, sometimes they are, and that is a, it's good. So it's not really Mahayana versus Theravada, it's more like certain people within Theravada versus certain people in Mahayana. And some people you will agree with, some Mahayana people you will agree with more than some Theravada people, yeah, because they have weird ideas, yeah. It's the, the problem is the same for all of these schools. The problem is that all of these schools have developed after the time of the Buddha. So Theravada has developed, that's why you have the Abhidhamma, that's why you have the Visuddhimagga, that's why you have the commentaries, uh, that's why you have the, the large number of books in Pali, the, uh, well, I don't, don't even know what, they, what they're called, the uh, grammar books and dictionaries, actually Pali dictionaries, you know, written by Pali experts, the whole dictionary is just in Pali, so uh, you, you wouldn't be able to read it. Uh. 
and etc. etc. Yeah, so what do you take to be Theravada Buddhism? And um, most Theravadans will say all of that is Theravada Buddhism. But I'm not so interested in Theravada Buddhism. What I'm interested in is early Buddhism. I want to know what the Buddha taught. Uh, yeah, that is what is interesting to me. I'm you know, what Buddha Gosa taught, I mean, who is Buddha Gosa? Anyway, he may have been a good monk, but was he enlightened? He, I think he says specifically that he's not enlightened. Uh, does he really understand? Uh, so we often we rely on scriptures that we have no idea where they came from or who wrote them. Uh, and this is problematic. Uh, and it, it is why it is why it is so useful to come back to the word of the Buddha. So you come back to the four Nikayas, uh, yeah? Long discourse of the Buddha, middle-length discourse of the Buddha, connected discourse of the Buddha, and numerical discourse of the Buddha. Come back to that again and again. That's where I would say you should find your real inspiration here. So, and what is interesting, of course, is that those suttas, they exist also in Chinese translation. Some of them exist in Tibetan translation. Some of them exist in Sanskrit. Some of them exist in some very obscure languages, uh, like uh, Khotanese. How many people here have heard of Khotanese? Maybe not so many. It's a rare language, yeah? That's kind of, you've never heard about it. Uh, so I have to, I'm showing off by showing uh, I know these names. Uh. <laughs> Khotanese is a Central Asian language that died out a long time ago. It doesn't exist anymore. Uh. And then there's Sogdian, there's another one of these languages. Uh. And then there's Uyghur. Uyghur still exists, yeah? Uyghur is with the kind of the eastern provinces of China. And uh, they also, they have texts, Buddhist texts, written in Uyghur language. So they probably used to be Buddhists, the Uyghurs, uh, before they got converted to Islam. Uh, that's another interesting point uh, to all of these languages. Uh, and uh, so because of that, and very interesting, uh, you know, the very famous Taiwanese master, Yin Shen, uh, yeah, he was writing about what is, uh, you know, the, the word of the Buddha and these kind of things, and he analyzed the suttas, and the, he was a very, very famous, uh, probably the most famous Mahayana Buddhist coming from China. And uh, he said that the Agamas, uh, the Nikayas, uh, that is the word of the Buddha. He said that. He was a Mahayana Buddhist. He was the most influential of all Mahayana Buddhists. Uh, he was the one who was the uh, background, the one who influenced and uh, gave rise to Fo Guan Shan, uh, yeah, and the Dharmadra Mountain, and uh, also to, uh, what is it called again, that... Um, so Tzu Chi Foundation, yeah, all of these big organizations in Taiwan actually kind of sp sprang out of his teachings and his kind of support. Uh, so he was very influential in Taiwan, originally born in mainland China, but then he left for Taiwan later on. Uh, so he's a kind of celebrated scholar in, uh, in Buddhism. So don't make, don't need to kind of, so the question shouldn't be, in my opinion, you know, we don't need to differentiate so much between these various Buddhisms. What we should ask, rather, is what, where is the word of the Buddha? That, to me, is what matters. Uh, that is the important thing. And then we are on the right track. And I, I think that this is so obvious, in a sense. Yeah, I'd, There are large parts of the world that don't have this kind of idea, but often that is because, just because they haven't, are maybe not educated quite in this way. But I think this is how things probably will move yeah, in the future. There's already large movements happening in Thailand, for example. There is the uh, Buddha Vajna movement. Buddha Vajna is the word of the Buddha. There's a monk called Prakukrit who's leading that and is very popular between educated people in Thailand. Uh, why? Because, well, precisely because it just makes sense. Yeah, We want to go back to the word of the Buddha. Uh, it makes sense. Uh, he's a little bit uh, controversial, Prakukrit. So uh, uh, yeah, you can talk about him if you wish, but, uh, <laughs> but that's my... Uh, that, that's anyway. That's what he's doing. You have a similar kind of things happening in uh, uh, Sri Lanka. Yeah, movement back to early Buddhism. What did the Buddha really teach? Uh, lots of people who think like that for obvious reasons. Uh, they realize we have lost our way a little bit with writing too many books. So, um, yeah, I, I should I should probably confess that I have written a small book as well. That's that's really embarrassing, isn't it? <laughs> oh, oh. <coughs> so, uh, anyway. Uh, but I'm now what I'm doing now is better. I'm translating the Vinaya Pitaka now into English. That will be more interesting. <laughs> so, um, so I hope that helps. How do we know when a tradition has gone too far off Buddhist teachings? You compare it to the early suttas, uh, and if it doesn't match with the early suttas, then it has gone too far off. This can be quite difficult unless you are a bit of a scholar and you know what's going on, it can be quite hard to judge these things. But, uh, so then you can maybe go to somebody and ask them to get some advice, because it can be quite... These judgments are not easy to make, yeah, let's put it that way here. Yeah. Okay. Whoa!
Oh, okay. <laughs> it's very nice. Ajahn, Anjali Ajahn. This begins with a nice drawing of Anjali at the top there. That's very, very cool. Uh, question one. I would like to start learning suttas. Uh, please suggest where the best to start. Uh, is there a systematic way to learn the suttas? Uh, and there is a kind of a systematic way. The m systematic way is to uh, do go to the uh, uh, Bhikkhu, Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation. Uh, he has a, uh, a book called In the Buddha's Words, uh, yeah? and that is a, a, a compilation of some of the kind of important suttas in the Pali Canon, and they are compiled with according to categories and groups. So it gives you a very quick introduction to the to the suttas. Uh. And uh, because they are compiled and he has written it, he has written introductions and things. Yeah, so he has, so you can read his introductions. Uh, his English can be a little bit uh, kind of PhD level, but you know, you, you will probably make your way through it easily. Uh, so occasionally you may have to need a dictionary when you, but uh, anyway. So that's where you could start. And then from there, you can then just gradually just move on to the other suttas. Uh, the suttas come in different types. You have suttas that are more kind of direct teaching where the Buddha says, this is the way it is, yeah, direct teaching, and then you have suttas that are more inspirational, where you feel uplifted, like verses very often. Huh? So you may want to read the Dhammapada, for example, that can be very uplifting to read the Dhammapada. Or you can want, may want to read the Terigata, Terigata is the verses of the elder nuns, and notice that you are a woman, so because of that you may want to read that, because sometimes it's nice to read something of one's own gender, yeah, because sometimes we can relate better to our own gender, huh? for obvious reasons. So you may want to read those Terigata verses, you can find them on suttacentral.net, suttacentral.net, suttacentral in one word, and there the, the translation is there, it's an Ajahn Sujato translation. Huh? Then there are the Connected Discourses of the Buddha, and they are actually also very nice. The first book of the Connected Discourse is called the Sagata Vaga, which means the, the chapter with verse. And uh, many beautiful little teachings there, with devas and all kinds of things, and there's one chapter for bhikkhunis again, and all of these things. So that's also quite nice, the first part of that book. Yeah. But uh, yeah, anyway, so there's a few ideas for you. Huh? And uh, if you don't like it, then I guess don't know what to say, you come, come back next year, complain or something, huh? so see, <laughs> <laughs> see how things go. Huh? Yeah, Tr yeah. Mm. access to insight is another website, I personally don't, don't I'm, I don't prefer Adantani Sula's translation myself, I prefer, I prefer the Biki, Biki Bode, I, I think is the best one, huh, in my opinion, because huh? he has so many idiosyncratic things that are kind of out, out of left field, the dukkha is stress and that kind of stuff. Huh? And uh, well, I first started reading Did you? Okay. Okay, that's a good point. And you became a bhikkhuni, so that must be good. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. It made it made you a, it made you a bhikkhuni, so so it must be good. <laughs> Okay. I called him. Oh. <laughs> he said no. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. But now, now you have translations anyway. Uh, he, he did. He did translate it. He did. That's true. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. You have you seen my translation? I also have translation of the Bikuni Patimoka. The whole, whole Bikuni Vibhanga I have translated. Bikuni Kandaka. Everything. So we can. Anyway, we'll just um, one of these days it will come out. Number question number two: How best to deal with bodily tightness, bodily discomfort, and bodily pain during meditation? Uh, radiate metta to that particular area of the body, uh, or tell myself that this body is not I, and it is normal to have mild discomfort. Uh, um, usually, the last one doesn't really work. Yeah, you say it's not I, and then the, uh, two minutes later, it's exactly the same problem again. <laughs> So I, I, yeah, so I, I wouldn't try that. But what uh, the most important thing is to find a good posture for yourself. Uh, yeah, and postures can be any posture that you uh, you enjoy and, and you are at ease and you are relaxed in. Uh, it doesn't have you don't have to sit cross-legged on the floor. And if you do sit cross-legged, well, Brooke, use many cushions. Uh, yeah, so you can c when you get up very high and your legs kind of tilt forward, much more comfortable straight away. Uh. So I would say to try to find a more suitable posture. That's what I would recommend. Uh, and then you, you are more at ease. Uh, um, but, you know, at the end of the day, there's always going to be 
discomfort in the body. Even if you have the best posture in the world, after a while you will have some discomfort. This is just the nature of the body, you can't avoid that. Uh, so, uh, uh, what to do is to uh, s sit for periods of time that are not too long. Change your posture when you start to get too much discomfort. Uh, try maybe to lie down sometimes. Uh, yeah, All of these things you can do. Uh, it just depends on uh, um, w what you are doing in your meditation. If you're falling asleep, then don't lie down because it's going to get worse. You're going to really snore away, and everyone is going to, you know, everyone's going to have compassion for you, of course. But, uh, but uh, you know, what, you know how these things happen here. Uh. So just feel your way through this. Find the right way of uh, posture. Uh. And uh, the thing is that if your meditation goes really well, it won't be a problem anymore. Uh. If your meditation goes really well, you quickly become peaceful. The body is no longer a problem. Uh. So the reason why there's a problem is because you're not getting all that peaceful in the first place. Uh, yeah? And then it may not be worthwhile sitting for long periods of time because uh, you may not get any results. Uh. So um, just uh, yeah, so try some of those things uh, and then uh, see if that works. Uh, and uh, Okay. Third one, once the body and mind are relatively at ease, uh, instead of focusing on the breath, if one radiates metta outwards from the body, uh, visualized without focusing on anyone, uh, is, that is this considered meditation suitable? Uh, absolutely, yeah, you can do that, uh, please do that. If you feel that you're able to give rise to metta, to these, these uh, feelings, it's wonderful. Uh, and what you can do is you can start by giving rise to metta, and then you can take that metta with the breath, yeah? And you can kind of carry them together. Uh, you can like have, like you have metta for the breath almost. Uh, so this is very useful. Uh, that's, that's, uh, so if you are able to do that, uh, it's wonderful. Uh, so uh, that's fine, but eventually you may want to come back to the breath again to take it really deep, very, very one-pointed. Uh, it's easier to be one-pointed with the breath, uh, precisely as you say, the focusing metta outward may not be maybe too kind of broad uh, a field or whatever. Uh, so come back to the, come back to the breath. Some people apparently can go into jhana states just through metta, but uh, may maybe that's possible. I'm not sure. Dear Ajahn, how to move forward from mind that clings to dullness and drowsiness. Uh, it's like stuck into those state, in those dullness states uh, only. Uh, thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, so uh, you have to kind of understand the reason why the mind is dull. Yeah, and the reason really is because you haven't got enough happiness in your meditation practice. Uh, that's when dullness comes. Uh, so this is why. But the Buddha emphasizes so much the idea of giving rise to joy, piti, giving rise to happiness, pamudra, gladness, and all these kind of things. Uh, because a happy mind is never going to be dull. You're going to be sharp as a razor blade. When you do something you enjoy in this world, generally you tend to become very sharp. Uh, so see if you can give rise to a bit of joy. Remember also that dullness is also very common because you push yourself too much. Uh, yeah, The mind doesn't want to be here because it's just uncomfortable to be here if you push yourself. Uh, and if that is what you're doing, then um, just sit back a bit more, relax a bit more. Uh, yeah, And uh, don't push. Remember the idea of sitting in an armchair. Uh, you come back from work, you're really tired, uh, you're not really doing anything at all, you're just sitting there. Uh, that's a very nice idea for, how, for no effort in your meditation practice. Uh, and then it may be that your mind, because it enjoys it more, that the, the dullness will disappear. The dullness is often you want to just blot out the world because the world is painful. That's often why you have people have dullness. So uh, just relax, just enjoy, just sit back, yeah, just wait, be very patient. Patience is one of the most important things in, the, in this meditation business. So try a different posture. And if all of that doesn't work, and if you find it hard to give rise to joy, then one of the things you may have to do is just to carry on with the basics of the Buddhist practice. Uh, and as you carry on with the basics, eventually those will mature. And they mature, and then you will access that joy much more easily afterwards, once all the, uh, you know, the kindness aspects of the path come together. Uh. Okay, so uh, I think I need to go back to my room, uh, because I, uh, I need a bit of rest before the next one. So. Um, that's it. So we'll see, so see you again this evening and uh, also another day tomorrow. So that's, that's great.